we do a collier do over because it's just. The rubber is probably stuck. Nothing was recorded, at least on this side. You know what? So, so you have to look at it or not. <laughs> we got the echo. Do this one. I don't. So hopefully this is clear, echoless. Yes. My name is Stuart Sinclair Weeks. I'm the founder of the Center for American Studies. And these are conversations with my esteemed colleague, Andrew Williams Jr. and Concordian Conversations. Um, we are working together. We're here on the grounds of Orchard House, the home of the Alcotts. And I suspect a good many of you have heard of Louisa May Alcott and Little Women, this beloved um, not just a children's story, but a story really for all ages. We're here on Lexington Road in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and I come often here just to sit and watch the people from all over the world, of all races, ethnic backgrounds, socioeconomic classes, who make a pilgrimage to Orchard House. And it's wonderful to watch the families, grandmothers, mothers, daughters, who've grown up with little women. There's something in this book, this genial book, that has touched millions of hearts. But there's more to the story. Louisa May didn't appear out of the blue. She had a mother, she had a father, she had three sisters, who we know from the play, from the book, Little Women. And I will read a little bit of it, but first I'm gonna step outside this tent. I mentioned earlier, it's a bit of an overcast day with intermittent rain. And I wanna show you the grounds. So I'll step outside and then I'll come back and read from the beginning of Little Women. And then um, the focus today are words of Dr. King, which Louisa May Alcott and her father Bronson understood well, which is everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Mm -hmm. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And I'm going to be asking our guest, um, Calvin Pearson from Hampton, Virginia, to speak about that with respect to a young man named Booker T. Washington, who walked many a mile to get an education in order to serve. But first, I'll step outside and I will give you a brief tour, and then I'll come in, I'll read from the beginning of the Little Women. So here we have the Orchard House. Here we have the home of the Alcotts. With an orchard in the back, it's called Orchard House with gardens. One of the most beloved and devoted tours in Concord. The people who work here have a deep love for the inhabitants of Orchard House who are very much alive in spirit. So I'll continue to the front of Orchard House, and then we'll go back to the tent. And I'll read you the beginning of the Little Women. Above the front door, above the front door upstairs on the right was Louise May Alcott's bedroom that looked out on the main road. And again, so this is the home of Louise May Alcott, her mother, Marmy, or Abigail Alcott, and her sisters, who we know of, many know of from the book, 
And this is the Hillside Chapel or Concord School of Philosophy, which we'll be speaking about in more length later in this, these offerings. Our focus today will not be on the Concord School of Philosophy, our focus this morning, not on the Concord School of Philosophy, but on the home of Mother Alcott and Four Little Women. As those who know the story are aware, Father Alcott was away at war. And that brings us to the beginning of the book. So I will read from the opening of The Little Women, which in a way says it all. I'm going to go on mute on my phone, Andrew, and let you direct that in the way you like. Okay. Not that it's making a difference. You can even look at it yourself for Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read from the beginning of Little Women. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, rumbled Joe, lying on the rug. It's so dreadful to be poor, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner. The four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at the cheerful words, but darkened again as Joe said sadly, we haven't got father and shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say perhaps never, but each added, added it silently, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. And now I go on to address my beloved son, Oshin. The fighting referred to was that which Oshin divided your mother and my forebears and will continue to do so with you and your descendants until the civil war is recognized for what it truly was. Indeed, is it surprising that unprotected, unable to protect myself, that having taken up the torch as the founder of the Center for American Studies, spoken of by an old black gentleman, would end up bearing that torch on behalf there too of you, my Southern Northern son, and poet warrior, with whom on either side of the Mason-Dixie line can one make mention of, never the mind discuss the following historical footnote, revelation, business as usual. This, friends, that follows is a note by Bismarck about what he suggests, the German leader was really behind the Civil War and my brothers here, um, Calvin and Andrew, I hope can speak to this, whether it's accurate or not. The division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained in one block, that is united as one nation would attain economic and financial independence which would upset their financial domination over Europe and the world. They saw an opportunity for prodigious booty if they could substitute two feeble democracies burdened with debt to the financiers in place of a vigorous Republic sufficient unto herself. Therefore they sent their emissaries into the field to exploit the question of slavery and to drive a wedge between the two parts of the Union. The rupture between the North and the South became inevitable. The masters of European finance employed all their forces to bring it about the Civil War and to turn it to their advantage. Lincoln spoke, in fact, to this fact. 
So there's a thread there that we'll return to in a moment, but I want to say a little bit more about where we are and a little bit of background, and then I'd love to hear from Calvin and, and Andrew on this matter. So Louisa May had a father and a mother. We know of Marmy. We just hear of the father in Little Women. But Bronson Alcott was considered by Emerson to be one of the greatest minds of the day. And he was thus considered because he had a remarkable heart. He was an educator. He educated young children. He loved the young children. And as I said earlier to Calvin, he loved them so much that when they misbehaved, he took that as a reflection on his own teaching. And instead of swatting them with a switch, he had the children swat him. As you can imagine, because of his love for them and their love for him, they didn't misbehave very often. He started a school in Boston called the Temple School. And the Temple School was very, very popular until he brought in a black girl. And that fact was used as a pretense for closing down the school. That is, the parents said to him, if you don't get rid of this black girl, we're gonna close down the school. Bronson's response was close down the school. So they did. And there were other issues involved as well, besides just the black girl. Um, the other issues were that he was talking about the, the, the Bible and he was talking about immaculate conception. He was talking about these matters that the parents didn't think were appropriate to speak with, with young children. And thus, the book that's been written about him entitled, How Like an Angel Came I Down. But certainly the presence of the black girl at that time was an unfortunate consideration. And so when they said, get rid of the black girl, we'll close down the school. He said, close down the school. And they did their best, um, gradually one by one, separated until Bronson was simply educating his four little women and this young black girl. So he stayed true. Um, he inspired this father. He inspired Louisa May Alcott. He inspired his other sisters and um, inspired and challenged his mother because he wasn't the classical breadwinner. His focus wasn't on the bottom line, but on the top line. And he took seriously the words of the scriptures, which are easily to forget or to dismiss as being impractical or unrealistic. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be given unto you. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Bronson understood that, as did the other conquered authors, Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, <laughs> Margaret Fuller. And this is what has distinguished the town in many ways. So I want to go to. Um, a last picture of the Alcotts, and then to turn to these questions that have been addressed with Andrew and Calvin. And that is, in seeking the kingdom of God, one day a neighbor knocked on the Alcotts door and it was winter and it was cold. And the way you kept warm that is kept from freezing was with firewood and the neighbor sheepishly when Bronson opened the door to said that they had no more wood and he had children and he wondered if he could um, borrow some wood. Although you don't borrow wood, you burn it up. Well, when Bronson heard the knock and went to the door, his wife and daughters followed him because they knew their dear old dad. And so when this question was asked if Bronson could possibly lend some of their wood. Bronson had a tap on the shoulder from his dear wife, as I envision it. And he turned to her. And there was an expression on his face. And I invite you all to consider what that expression might have been, because she then took a deep breath and was relieved. He said to his neighbor, take as much wood as you wish. And the neighbor took as little as he could because he knew that if the Alcots didn't have wood, they also would freeze. Well, the next morning came another knock on the door 
And this was a neighboring farmer who had a whole sledge full of wood that was stranded in the snowstorm that occurred over the night. And he knocked a bit sheepishly on the door and he apologized. But he said, can I leave the sledge there? And he said, you can have as much wood as, you, as you'd like in return for that inconvenience. So this is what I would tell my children when they were young is an example of the real, real world. Not the real world in quotes, but the real, real world. So now I'd like to come to what was read and come to Dr. King's words that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And I'd like to invite um, Calvin here, our visitor, our blessed guest from Hampton, Virginia, to speak about a young black man who made his way to Hampton, met there a remarkable general of whom I'll say a brief word, and then made his way on to Tuskegee. You're still the camera person, so this. Oh, well, I've got, I'm here. Can you pull me up? Oh, you have to register. You have to come in. I am. Oh, you're here? Yeah. Okay, so let's see. I believe you can continue to speak, Mr. Calvin Pearson. Welcome, everyone. I am Calvin Pearson. You have to look at yourself, though. Oh, let's see here. Stuart Calvin Pearson. We're getting there, friends. This is yeah, still morning time here. <laughs> I, I don't see your photo. 20s might be simpler company is that well there i am yeah but i don't see your um video so, you know your video neither your video nor your voice are connected here, Calvin. okay all right i think we're connected now yeah. uh good morning everyone uh i am calvin pearson i'm founder of project 1619 incorporated in hampton project 1619.org I've been teaching African-American history and the story of the first enslaved Africans since 1994. Today, I was asked to speak a little bit about Booker T. Washington. Now, the story of Booker T. Washington is very long. And uh, so I'm gonna do some highlights this morning about, about Booker T. Washington and his connection to uh, present day Hampton University so when we go back and we look at the career of Booker T. Washington, when he was growing up, his name was Booker. Everybody called him Booker. He, he said he did not know what his middle name was, did not know what his last name was, didn't even know when he was born. His date of birth was not even determined until after he died in 1915. Historians came up with a birth date of, of 1856. Now he tells a, a, a dreadful story about growing up on a plantation in Southwest Virginia. Uh, he, he talks about the, how poor the family was, uh, how they had to scrap around to get food to eat. He said the family never sat down at the table to have a meal together. The family never prayed over a meal together. And that was the way he was raised. When he was about seven years old, according to historians, he said a white man came to the plantation that he was living on. Um, and we got to remember too, that he was enslaved in 1856, along with his mother, Jane. White man came to the plantation and started reading this long document. And he said he didn't know what the guy was reading, but after he left, uh, they tried to explain to him that it was the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Uh, that those on the plantation were now free. Uh, so he had to understand what freedom was all about because, again, he had been enslaved all his life. His mother, Jane, decided that she was going to pick up the family and move to West Virginia. So they moved to West Virginia. And still uh, a dreadful life in West Virginia, although they were, they were now free. Booker then decided that he wanted to try to go to school at a later age. So when he went to school, the people asked him, what's your surname? He says, I don't know. All I know is Booker. And th by this time, his wife, his mother, Jane, had remarried. And he married, she married a guy whose first name was Washington. So when he asked him for a surname, they said, well, you need to give us a surname. So he said, OK, I'm, I'm Booker Washington. 
he went back home and told his mother that he had to give a surname and he gave Booker Washington. His, his mother said, well, you know, when I had you, I gave you a name, but you never knew it. I called you Booker Tyler Farrow. He went back to school and he says, okay, I'm changing my name. I'm Booker Tyler Farrow Washington. From that day forward, he became Booker Tyler Farrow Washington. We called him Booker T. Washington. When he got to a certain age, he decided that he needed higher education. Now, legend has it that he walked from West Virginia to Hampton Institute. Uh, no verification of that, but that's the legend. That's the story that people have been telling all, all of our lives, that he walked to Hampton Institute, which at that time was Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. One thing I've never figured out is why was black schools called normal? Was there an abnormal school that we, we're not aware of, but now all of a sudden we're normal humans? So Hampton Normal and Agriculture Institute was established in 1868 by a guy named General Samuel Chapman Armstrong. Now this general was born in Hawaii. His parents were missionaries and he moved to the United States to become a missionary. But what happened was he joined the army and rose all the way to the rank of, of general. After the Civil War was over with, he then started leading the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established to teach those newly freed uh, Africans how to uh, develop into um, people who could go out and get a job, further their education, et cetera. So this is 1868. Booker T. Washington decided, as I said, to, to try to leave West Virginia and make his way to Hampton. Uh, when he got to Hampton, he had no money. He went to the headmaster and says, I'm here for an education. I have no money. So they said, okay, we're going to give you a, a, a swish broom and a dustpan, and we want you to go into this room to clean it. Now, how you clean it determines whether you're going to remain here as a student. He went to that classroom, cleaned it. The people went behind him with white gloves on, couldn't find a speck of dirt. They said, okay, we're going to admit you here at Hampton, uh, but you're going to have to work your way through college. And so he did that. After he left Hampton, he went to another school. But at during the same time, uh, General Chapman Armstrong looked at Booker T. Washington almost like he was a son. He had taken him under his wings to teach him everything he knew about running a university. Around uh, 1880, uh, Samuel Chapman Armstrong said, Booker T. Washington, there is a school being developed in Tuskegee, Alabama, and I think you would be the right person to run this new school. He goes to Tuskegee, Alabama in 1881, uh, they accept him and hire him as their new headmaster, uh, president, or whatever you want to call him, because at that time they were not presidents. A lot of times they were called principals. So he went to uh, Alabama, started Tuskegee. Uh, this is 1881. And just like Hampton Normal and Tuskegee Normal, the kids on the, in the school are the ones who had to build the campus. They had to, they had to make the bricks. Um, and they built all the buildings uh, with student labor. And that's how both of these institutions were built from the ground up by students. So the Booker T has a long, long history. We know that, that in between 1890 and 1915, when he died, he was one of the leaders um, and advocates in the United States on education. We know that the most of the presidents between 1890 and 1950 called on Booker T. Washington for advice. So we look at him, upon him as one of the leading African-American scholars in the United States during his time. And because of his efforts, we have the prestigious Tuskegee Institute um, that it was called during his time. So Booker T. is just one of the, the people that we talk about when we talk about the quest for education. Sometimes it's, it's a struggle. In his case, it was a struggle to be educated. And we have so many people in our community and in our past who've, who've shown their way um, that the struggle in the end is worth it. So it, 
we, we go from Booker, we go up to people like Martin Luther King Jr. and other people who, who tried to lead the way uh, so that we could have a better education. So that's just a brief overview of the accomplishments and the value that Booker T. Washington had on education here in the United States. Calvin, thank you very much. And I'd like to read what Booker T. Washington said about General Samuel Chapman Armstrong. And also note, and correct me, Calvin, if I'm wrong, that um, the account of his walking to Hampton was from his own autobiography up from slavery. Whether that makes it legitimate or not, we don't know, but he did write his own story. And it's a remarkable story that's worthy of being read and reread. But I want to read you what Booker said, T. Washington said about Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who became like a father for a number of reasons. General Armstrong was white. Booker T. was black. We live in times where divide and the theme is divide and conquer, where the pressure from many, many sides is to focus on our differences as opposed, as opposed to what unites us. So I offer these words from Booker T on Samuel Chapman Armstrong as nothing else than an expression of by um, one person of how he viewed, in this case, Booker T's white brother or father, General Armstrong. Booker wrote, he was the most perfect specimen of man, physically, mentally, and spiritually, the most Christ-like, he goes on, I've spoken of my admiration for General Armstrong, and yet he was but a type of that Christ-like body of men and women who went into the, the Negro schools at the close of the war by the hundreds to assist in lifting up my race. The history of the world fails to show a higher, purer, purer and more unselfish class of men and women than those who found their way into those Negro schools. Now this is but one perspective, but I wanna turn now with Andrew, if Andrew is so moved and with um, Calvin to Dr. King's words. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Starting with Andrew, do you wish to comment on that at all? And then Calvin, if he wishes. I'd like Calvin to begin first. I'd like to bring something up and share my screen. Well, I think we agree with his words uh, that everyone can be great and can serve. Um, but we, we got to paraphrase that is that theoretically is correct, but the opportunity must present itself. So with the, with the proper opportunities, uh, anyone can be successful. Uh, but we live in a society, we live in an imperfect society where the spoken word is not always truthful. Uh, so there are people who, uh, through their initiative, their enthusiasm, can exceed better than some people. Uh, so it's all, you've got to put it all in context. I've always believed in volunteering. Um, I think volunteering terrorism is the way that this country was built. Everybody can't be paid. Uh, if, if you want to volunteer for the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, Boys and Girl, Boys and Girls Club, it takes volunteers to run these organizations. So, the, so for my entire adult life, I always have volunteered in some type of capacity. So, you could be poor or rich; you can still volunteer in some type of capacity. Um, so those are some thoughts that I've been carrying with me all my life is that when you see a person in need or you see an organization in need, you are giving your time. Um, it doesn't cost anything to be a volunteer. It's well rewarding to be a volunteer because <laughs> you've got to volunteer for the right reasons. It's not about you. It's not about, um, is really about what you do for others. I've always believed in the value of life is what you do for others and not what you do for yourself. 
And that's why volunteering in this country is so important. We're at a time in this country where so many organizations need volunteers, whether it's the church, civic organization, community organization, community center, all these organizations need volunteers because they would go bankrupt if they tried to pay everybody uh, as a paid employee to come in and do work. That's why volunteering tourism is so important to this country. So that's why I value his statements. I think it's something that, that we can all live by. Um, so those are just some quick comments on, on what I think about uh, our contributions as mankind to this country. Thank you. And just to add, so Calvin has volunteered years and years to become one of the premier historians of the true Black history, which we'll be hearing more in this weekend program. Well, thank you, Stuart's entire weeks. Thank you very much, Calvin Pearson. I do certainly appreciate and recognize the value of service. However, in my particular case, <clears throat> I have a lifelong dedication that arose out of the struggles and the successes and also the vision of Dr. the Reverend Dr. Actually, Michael Luther King was his fourth birth name. His father changed that to Martin after his birth. However, <clears throat> it was on the birth of my consciousness and the birth of my mother having to share the talk with me in segregated Macon, Georgia. In on April 4th, 1968, that drove into my heart the necessity to uplift Dr. King's work throughout the rest of my life. It took me 40 years to be able to reach a point in my life when I was 50 years old to make the dedication real. If you now Google my name, Andrew Williams Jr., you'll find that that footprint is known worldwide for championing causes I care about as a volunteer for many of those years. But I do wanna share my screen with you now to remind all of you that it's not just ourselves that we have to pay homage to or to have to assist or have a commitment to look after, but the entire country has now succeeded in standing on the shoulders of Martin Luther King every year for the Martin Luther King Jr. National Day of Service. However, one day is not enough. So for those of you like me, whose life have been impacted by Dr. King, I urge you, I implore you, and I honor you for making a commitment for what Stuart Sinclair Weeks calls a new citizens movement. I'll have, let him explain that a bit more to you, but take for an example this. What if instead of just celebrating Martin Luther King's National Day of Service one day a year, what if we do it every day of every year? What if we at least acknowledge the fact that some part of our day every day is devoted not to our own selfish interests or even those of our family or even those of our neighborhood, but perhaps of the earth itself? The day of service does not limit what you're able to do or what you're able to share. But again, if you just take time to Google Martin Luther King National Day of Service, and think about ways that you might want to show in your local area, in your local life, ways that you are already serving. Keep in mind too, we're reaching you now on a platform, Facebook, that also is connected to YouTube. Together, they have, I think, at a conservative estimate, over a billion viewers. But look, you have the power in your hand, if you're walking along with your phone, to become more than just a consumer. You can be a producer, and what you can produce are good works. You can produce appreciation for those in your experience that are doing good works, that are doing service for others. In fact, you can become what I've been for the last 50 years, a citizen journalist. And you can take advantage of the service take advantage of the opportunity to use the device in your hand to deliver a very important service. And that service is this, uniting together to create a narrative of the good works that people are doing, of the successful 
um, projects that are being accomplished. As we all, or at least many of us know, the entire world, when I say that, I mean only 193 countries in the world, only 193 countries, or I should say only 193 governmental representatives of countries have agreed. Well, I'll start to say since 2015, because many of you will recognize that we're in what's called the sustainable development goal phase of the United Nations from 2015 to 2030. But I have to ask you to go back further to the millennium, the millennium development goals. That was a lofty idea that we could achieve peace on earth during our lifetime in this millennium. And so <clears throat> I urge all of you to just Google sustainable development goal number 16, peace and strong institutions. But what Stuart Sinclair and I are asking you to do is don't rely upon those people that are in the positions in those organizations to do what is supposed to be done in the community. Open your eyes and understand how you yourself are in most cases doing the work that is actually needed and also demanded, but so few of our quote elected politicians are able or willing to do. So it's up to you and us to tell the story of how we, the people, are getting the things done in the service of our community. I'm also gonna briefly share with you uh, on my screen here, a, a quote that many of you may be familiar with, which is that Martin Luther King was a drum major for peace. In fact, if you Google it again, the Washington Post has a very interesting article. What does this quote mean? I was a drum major for peace and righteousness. I was a drum major for righteousness and all of the other shallow things will not matter. This comes at the end of a long and powerful sermon. The speech called the drum major instinct is about the desire and the human spirit to be great without doing any great or difficult things. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Stuart Sinclair Weeks because again, we're not asking you to be great, but to be good. But I'll let him explain more about that in detail. Thank you. Andrew, wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Andrew is an example of one whose greatness lies in his goodness, lies in his service. As he said, his roots, his own roots are African-American, Native American, and Anglo-American. And the mission that he gave himself, along with his dear mother upon Dr. King's assess, excuse me, assassination was to bring the peoples together. And he's doing it as a citizen's journalist. And if I'm hearing him clearly, he's calling upon you all to do the same. Everybody can be great because everybody can, everybody can serve. So he asked me about the citizens movement to revive the spirit of public service. And I'll speak to it briefly. I wanna come back to my brothers here. Our work is to bring a new ethic into the world that may already exist, but we give it the name servantship, not leadership, not servant leadership, but servantship, echoing Dr. King's words that we've noted now a number of times. Everyone can be great because everybody can serve. And what it's about is inviting people who feel moved to public service, not to say, give me your time, give me your energy, give me your money, give me your hopes, and if I'm elected, I'll do A, B, and C. If not, see you later, but to do it. Not to talk the talk, but to walk the talk. To walk the talk. That is to serve, not with a lot of hoopla, not with a lot of expectation, but to serve. That is to assume the mantle of the office you may feel called towards, from president all the way up to dog catcher, to simply assume that mantle, that office, from a constitutional perspective. So constitutional dog catcher, constitutional selectman, constitutional town manager, constitutional county commissioner, constitutional legislator, congressman, senator, or president. 
And we emphasize constitutional because many people who are elected to office have broken their, their pledge or their vow to serve before they even step across a threshold into their office by being elected on a partisan platform. So they've already broken their vow of office if their approach has been a partisan one before they even step into their office. That's what we mean by constitutional office. So to assume the mantle and serve, to do good deeds. And if you do good deeds from a dog catcher to president, constitutional president, as a placeholder or standard bearer, that is, it's not about me, but about we, the people. So as a placeholder and standard bearer for the office, if you do good deeds, those deeds will be newsworthy. They will attract the attention. They'll attract the publicity. And with the publicity will come funding without having to cozy up to editors or to donors. It is through our good deeds that one proceeds in the realm of public service. So that's an attempt to answer Andrew's question. I'd like to go back to Andrew and to Calvin. Um, and I'd like to invite any comments you may have, and this is a thread we'll take up later on the passage I read by Bismarck. And who knows if Bismarck knew what he's talking about. Perhaps Calvin, you and Andrew will have some perspectives, but his thesis is pretty simple. And it's summed up by the name of one of the more respectable scoundrels or less respectable scoundrels whose last name was Rothschild, who said, give me the control of the money. So he was a banker and a financier, and I don't need politicians and armies, all of whom need to be paid. Give me the control of the money, and I don't need politicians and armies. So what he's suggesting is it at least a contribution, Calvin and Andrew, to the Civil War was the attempts by the European powers, that is the financiers, to turn north against south, to agitate around the issue of slavery, so that instead of having one mighty nation that was mighty enough to trump the European powers, and we did win the American Revolution, there'd be two weaker um, sections of this country. So may I go to you? Calvin first and invite any comments you have on that thesis, being an historian, and then to Andrew, and then we'll bring this to a conclusion. Well, let's go to Andrew first, then we'll go back to Calvin. Um, so the thesis is, did Bismarck know what he's talking about, leader in Germany, and that is that a cause, if not significant cause, of the Civil War were the dealings of the financiers to, to use the issue of slavery to divide North from South. So instead of having one mighty nation, mighty enough to defeat the European powers, there would be two weaker <laughs> nations. In other words, there was agitation involved intentionally by the European financiers around the slavery issue to break the union in order to make it weaker. Is that a thesis, Calvin and Andrew, that makes sense to you as partial explanation? Well, I do not agree with it. Uh, there's so much discussion on the Civil War. You got one segment of society want to tell you it was about slavery. You got one segment want to tell you it was about states' rights. And my learned position is that the Civil War was about states' rights. And it became a battle over slavery, but it started out as a battle over states' rights. When we go back and we really look at the economy of the of, a, of during that time period, there was a battle between the North and the South. It was an economic battle. The South was growing the cotton and the corn, selling it to the North, 
the North was reselling it for huge profits, which they were not giving back to the South. So plantation owners in the South saying, I'm doing all the work and labor, and I'm giving you all the profits. You're putting tariffs on incoming and outgoing products. And we're not getting any of the proceeds from all the work that you're doing. So it really started out between states' rights. The South wanted uh, more economic division of the of the outgoing and incoming financial status, financial position in the United States, especially up in the New York area. Um, so when I read history, that's what I think started the Civil War. Uh, but then slavery came into it. And we got to go back to, to the reasons why um, Abraham Lincoln started looking at slavery during the Civil War. And we got to look at what he wrote. I mean, he wrote that he would, if he didn't have to free any slaves, he would not free them. The only way he would free a slave if, if was to save the Union. Uh, after the battle at, at Antietam, he his generals told him that you need to reconsider freeing the slaves because they want to help win this war. And we're looking at 180,000 colored troops left their plantations to go join the Union Army to help win the Civil War. So there were a lot of things going on at, during that time frame, but I, I don't particularly agree with everything he said uh, because historians have come up with their own opinions and justifications about the Civil War. Um, so it's still debatable all these years later. Thank you. Andrew. Well, thank you for allowing me to weigh in on this conversation. However, I would like to take a bit of a different perspective because the Europeans, as you're saying, had a vested interest in weakening the United States and also seeking to regain the dominance that had occurred. However, again, we're only talking about a particular period in time, the um, <clears throat> Civil War. I would have to address the European impact on American politics in a bit of a different way, because it was in fact the Americans who after the Civil War ended, went through a period of what they call reconstruction. At that time, many of the um, Blacks in the formerly uh, enslaved um, condition were able to run for office, were able to participate in political activities, many of whom achieved um, substantial success uh, throughout the United States, including the South. However, that was followed in 1877 okay. by what's called the um, Compromise of 1877, that effectively ended uh, Reconstruction and ended um, the efforts to provide a global playing fields for the uh, formerly enslaved people. I say that to say that because it was not many years after that, in 1883, that what I consider to be a corrupt United States Congress granted to King Leopold from Europe the official recognized, quote, ownership of the land that call Congo, or at, least at this time, <clears throat> it's still called the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but it was part of the Congo Kingdom. So with the um, influence of the American validation of that, this uh, <clears throat> King Leopold went into Berlin, and between 1884 and 1885, the United States was an observer of what had become known as the Berlin Conference and what subsequently was, became known as the Scramble for Africa. So I would say that the civil rights impact on um, the American economy in terms of the, the African-Americans had a great, much greater implication for those people on the continent of Africa itself that we're now seeing played out. In particular, as Stuart and I just recently were able to speak with the uh, son of, of uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Lumumba, who was the president of the Congo that was assassinated, according to historical records, 
by the machinations of not just the Europeans, but the Americans themselves. And now what we see in the Congo is, as you see, again, a scramble for resources, particularly for those that are impacting our cell phones, our um, solar energy, our renewable energy, the items and resources that are now at the feet of the people who were formerly <clears throat> at the feet of the monarchies are now at the feet of the economists. So uh, again, Stuart, I have to get this back to you because my point is this, we can't consider, I think these things in a bubble. We have to look at what has been happening in the past, what's happening now, and what we are gonna to decide to do and moving forward to the future together. Thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. So what I sought to contribute to our considerations are the words of a Rothschild. Give me the control of the money supply, the lifeblood of our nation, and I don't need politicians and armies, both of whom, all of whom need to be paid. This is a thread we'll take up, but I wanna bring this session to a conclusion by recounting another very moving aspect of history, which we'll pick up on the 4th of July, that occurred right where we are. And where we are is once again, the grounds of the Orchard House, the Alcott home on Lexington Road in Concord. And the tragedy that occurred here, Concord's interesting because you have layers and layers upon history, one upon the other, all inspired, all unfolding out of the other, was when the pilgrims arrived, and I'm, not, I'm referring to pilgrims, not Puritans, that is those who were pilgrims, not puritanical, plenty of Puritans were to follow the pilgrims, but when the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock, there were 54 years of peace among the pilgrims and the native peoples, in part because they both had suffered great losses. Half of the pilgrims had died, I think it was 54 on the ship, so only half of them actually arrived. And the native peoples they met here on these shores had many losses as well. But beyond that, since this was the first real contact, by contact I mean not just explorers or trappers, but actually families were coming to settle, I would suggest it was a providential connection. Little in life of significance is accidental, incidental, or coincidental. Rather, it's providential. There were 54 years of peace, but then as the waves and waves of Puritans arrived, rather puritanical, and swapped their covenant with the Lord for the manifest destiny, Tensions arose, perhaps inevitable. Some Native American friends and colleagues and trustees of the Center for American Studies suggest it wasn't entirely accidental, but may have been providential for better and for worse. The tensions led to the King Philip's War. And the King Philip's War was a challenge, particularly for the praying Indians, including the praying Indians here in Concord because they became the praying Indians or the spirited praying Indians because they found in the message of Christ something that spoke to them very deeply, something that the Hopi speak of when they speak of the true white brother, the true white brother. And so they had a very dis difficult decision to make. And that decision was on what side do they fight in the King Philip's war? You couldn't be on the fence in that war. They were red red men and women, if you will, and yet they'd found the Christ as a word they would use. Well, they went not with the blood, but with the spirit. And so they ended up fighting with the settlers, the Concordians. And the tragedy was that after the King Philip's war ended, which is one of the bloodiest wars in our history, um, those Concordians and and people of other communities who couldn't tell one red person from another had those who fought to defend them rounded up and marched to many of their deaths in Deer Island and Boston Harbor. So those praying Indians who had fought, who'd taken up, who'd safeguarded the impulse of Christ when there many of their white brothers and sisters had swapped it for the 
covenant of manifest destiny. They were marched and conquered from this very spot, Orchard House on Lexington Road to many of their deaths in, in Deer Island in Boston. But it wasn't without one Concordian at least standing up because the Concord School of Philosophy, which is right next to us, um, had been used as a stockade by a man named Hoare, H-O-A-R, to defend and safeguard the praying Indians. He knew them, he loved them, he tried to defend them, but Concordians called in a certain scoundrel named Colonel Mosley and he, he and his rough riders overpowered for and marched the praying Indians, as I said, to many of their death. Well, this I think is relevant because the chief of the praying Indians, Chief Caring Hands, who's a dear friend and a sister and has been part of the work, she lifted up her spirit, passed away on Palm Sunday, and she is being nominated as a potential recipient of the Concord Noble Award for Peace. The Concord Noble Award for Peace to do justice if we're able to her and her legacy. We'll be picking that thread up as well, but I'm gonna pass it back to Andrew to close this off. Um, my co-host here, this first session on Saturday morning. Well, thank you so very much. This is again, Conversations with Andrew Wayne Jr. and Concordian Conversations today. And we're streaming from here in <clears throat> Concord, Massachusetts, where we're hoping you'll join us for the entire weekend celebration. We began yesterday. This is Juneteenth, 2023. And this is actually a series in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Race Matters. But let me have Stuart, before we close, tell you a little bit more about the umbrella that we're working with. And so the National Forums on Races, well, let, I'll let Stuart tell you. So to tie up that thread, the Center for American Studies under our work, Race Matters, has put on national forums on race. We began in Tuskegee, we went to Atlanta, we went to Charleston, and we set a uh, planted a seed here in Concord with Bernard Lafayette, who Dr. King, to whom Dr. King gave the mandate on the eve of his assassination in the Lorraine Motel to institute nonviolence globally. Bernard headed up the Voters' Rights March in Selma. He's a dear friend and colleague in the work. And so we planted the seed for our National Forum on Race in Concord. And the essence of the National Forums on Race is to look at our history as a drama. Scene one was a near tragedy, the virtual annihilation of the native peoples of this land. I believe, as I stated in Tuskegee in the opening words, we were hosted by the mayor of Tuskegee, by the superintendent of the National Park, the famous Tuskegee National Park, and the president of the university spoke. I mentioned that if a redemptive impulse had not come with scene two in this drama of our new world, I don't think the show would have continued on the road. I don't think we would have had a future worth envisioning. And that redemptive impulse, I believe, came from those Africans and African-Americans who understood what Dr. King meant when he said unearned suffering is redemptive. And so my point was we have a huge debt, a huge debt of gratitude and appreciation and honor to our African and African-American brothers and sisters who've understood these words of Dr. King, unearned suffering is redemptive for their character and their spirit has what been what I believe has kept the holy flame of the heart here in our new world burning. So we will be having the, um, the Fuller National Forum on Race here in Concord, Massachusetts, and then in Concord, New Hampshire during the first in the nation primaries that are upcoming, um, where we'll be focusing this issue on this incredible debt we owe to our African and African-American brothers and sisters. Well, thank you very much, Stuart Sinclair Weeks. And we're going to wind up today's, or at least this part of today's show. We will be back later today, and we ask you to join us. You can uh, take a look on the screen, and all weekend we'll be celebrating Juneteenth, 2023. And you can 
<clears throat> join us through a registration link, bit.ly forward slash Concord dash Juneteenth dash 2023. And the registration code is 777-7777. Thank you so much, Andrew Williams Jr. You can follow us on our Facebook group, Ayakba TV Network. And also you can follow uh, or reach me at andrew at andrewnetworks.com. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic day.